Thank you, Beth. You know, Roland Nitzscher and I were just out in the commons a little bit ago talking about that sweet day when we're going to meet the Lord in the sky. That's going to be quite a day, huh? Well, let me move this out of the way. I don't, you know, if I get riled up or worked up or wired up, I want to be able to come down to the audience and ask questions to individuals like a talk show host. <clears throat> Well, if you come to my class on uh, Wednesday nights, I always tell people, it was Victor Borg who said, the shortest distance between two people is humor. So let's start off with a little humor, shall we? Um, we've heard the theory that the longer a husband and wife are married, they, they begin to look like one another, right? I keep waiting for Michelle's goatee to come in. <laughs> <laughs> So what about our pets? Look at these. How about this one? It gets better. Even the tilt of... <laughs> these two last ones are my favorites. Look at there. And of course, my favorite. <laughs> oh, so we're at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. While you're finding that, either in your uh, Bible with literal pages in it, or on your phone or iPad, however you want to go there, uh, let me remind you a little thing about Colossians. In chapter 1, um, it was the theologian John Stott, the Brias theologian, who said that passage about the supremacy of Christ, the deity of Christ, he is before all things. He holds in him all things hold together, is the loftiest passage of Christ's deity in all of Scripture. And then Paul covers a number of things. This is one of those what's titled or categorized as the prison epistles or the prison letters. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Now, it is true that Paul wrote 2 Timothy from prison. Somehow that got left out of the category. But he's writing this from prison, and he covers a lot of things. And folks, here at the end of his letter, well, he starts really stepping on toes. Now, Paul always writes these letters in response to trouble or issues that he hears about from these different churches. So today, it's family relationships, wives, husbands, husbands, wives, children to parents, and so forth and so on. He even gets into employers and employees, and if we have enough time, we'll, we'll do that. Um, but Jason, thank you, sir, has uh, assigned me this, this wonderful passage of Scripture, and I'm just telling you, by the end of the morning, I probably will have offended everyone in here. Uh, and so just stay with me. I promise not to break the 11th commandment, thou shalt not bore. Oh, also a disclaimer. As we're talking about wives, how you respond to husbands, husband, how you respond to wives, children to parents. Look, I mean, this, some of this is going to be pretty intense. But remember, there's no shame or blame here. Paul wrote, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction comes from the Lord. So if you're sitting there today and you, you just feel guilty and I, I should do better, okay, do better. But no condemnation here out of conviction. And watch the Lord work. Now let me offer this also. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, he's the former atheist, of course, who attended Oxford and the author of the Narnia Chronicles, and a number of outstanding mere Christianity, the screw tape letters, and so forth and so on. He said this, he said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Now, why would I share that today? Because anytime we talk about theology, the Bible, the gospel, look, you can reject it, or you can receive it. One thing that you can't do is to be indifferent about it. This is a matter of life and death, the words of God. So let's jump into this passage, shall we? 
Oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. No, really, really. Hope you have a miserable time at your family reunion. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. And then this passage on employer-employee. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people-pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done from the Lord or for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord and you serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism with God. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. So as I thought about this, I thought, honestly, I'd rather preach on circumcision than have to preach on this. <laughs> but I have to resonate with Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from the 19th century in London, preached at Metropolitan Chapel there. And he said, my friend, my natural love for you makes me wish that I could preach only present things, but I dare not preach a soft gospel. Jesus didn't, and my friends, I won't today. So let's jump into this. Oh, boy. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Now, this is a tricky one. Why? Because many of us husbands are idiots. Look at this. The wife says, you know, you're really making me reconsider my belief in reincarnation because no one can get that stupid in a single lifetime. <laughs> Michelle and I, listen, if you're a young husband, just listen. Someone once said the easiest lessons to learn are from the mistakes of others. It took me about 30, no, 25 years to finally recognize and admit to Michelle you're right, 98% of the time. I get my 2%, and we document those times. <laughs> my girls are in on it. We were on vacation. Michelle said, no, no, this is right. She was wrong. I was right. My girls and me all just lifted up the 2%. It's something we're very, very proud of. Um, as you can imagine, this passage sometimes is promoted by abusers who are husbands. And we'll get to that in a second. But there's no abuse in this. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That would be an irresponsible biblical interpretation. Ladies, not once does God instruct you to serve as a doormat or a punching bag for your husband. Not once does God instruct you to keep your mouth shut and let your man do all the talking. Not once. It is a 100%, 100% relationship. So now let's exposit the text. Exposit simply means to draw out the meaning, to unpack it, so to speak. So let's see what Paul was saying here. Now, systematic theology is when you interpret Scripture in light of Scripture. Cult leaders don't believe in this. What they do is they take a single passage of Scripture and they make it mean whatever they want it to mean. So when we interpret Scripture, we let God do the interpreting. So there's a parallel passage that Paul wrote also from prison, as I mentioned earlier, the letter to the Ephesians. And he says almost the same thing, expounds on it a little bit. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, you better highlight that. Christ is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands. So listen. What God is telling wives is to submit to the loving leadership of your husband. You don't submit to sarcasm, to rudeness, to hatefulness, to abuse of any kind. You submit to the loving leadership of your husband. Guys, I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down because you're next. Interestingly, we see that passage in Luke chapter 2. We know almost virtually nothing of Jesus' childhood. 
we have that one passage where he gets lost. <laughs> well, actually the parents got lost in Jerusalem, and here Jesus is in the temple, and I can see Mary and Joseph. Of course, they're in a caravan. You know, you think, good grief, how do you lose your son like that? They're probably with hundreds and hundreds of people. They think Jesus is with a cousin or something like that when they finally realize, and I can just hear them arguing, Joseph and Mary. Where is he? Well, he's your son. Well, so forth and so on. But it says at the end of that passage that Jesus went down to Nazareth with his parents and was continually submissive and obedient. It's the same Greek word used here for being submissive. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul wrote, But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. Look, this isn't about your husband being able to tell you what to do. It is about God's established order that only works when we apply it as God intended for us to do. So that last phrase in wives submit to your husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. What does that mean? Just what I just said. As is fitting or as according to God's plan. This is about God's order, folks. If you have an issue with it, your issue is not with me. It's with Christ. You sort it out with him. One final word, and I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Most of you know, I grew up in a horrifically violent home. My dad was very abusive. I saw it up close and personal. As a teenager, there was one time I had to defend my mom physically. It was horrible. Never, ever, ever, ladies, are you to endure an abusive relationship or marriage. Any girls in here, there'll be more in the later service. Dating, same thing applies there. I've Listen, the, the guys that my girls date, and it probably has a lot to do with how I grew up, but I tell them, and I tell them nicely, my friend, you do anything to my daughter. If you break her spirit, I'll break you. And I mean that as much as I possibly can. <laughs> so, husbands, now, whoo, got through that. <laughs> husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Folks, husbands, are you present when she's in the room and trying to talk to you about something that she feels important? I saw a guy one time, it was a brilliant illustration. He talked about the woman's brain and the husband's brain. The wife's brain, I mean, it is interconnected. I mean, wires going everywhere, multitasking. The husband, we have little boxes, and we only go to one box at a time. Here's the work box. Uh, here's the play box. Uh, here's the, and he, this is what he says. Here's the mother-in-law box. And then, and he says, here's the nothing box. Wives, we husbands have a nothing box. You've been here before. I'm sitting in the living room. Michelle says, what are you thinking? I don't think about anything. That's impossible. It's really not. <laughs> right now, I'm trying to think how to get out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Fel <laughs> Fellas, when was the last time you lovingly paid attention to your wife? Look at this. My wife just stopped and said, you weren't even listening, were you? I thought, well, that's a pretty weird way to start a conversation. That is an actual quote from uh, Peggy Abbott to Dave Abbott. <clears throat> <laughs> so in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul said that we should act like men to be strong and let all we do be done in love. John Elridge is a tremendous counselor and author. In his book, Wild at Heart, my copy is well-worn, he said this, In the heart of every man is a desperate desire for three things, a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. Guys, what movies do we resonate with? The Jason Bourne trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, Gladiator, Are You Not Entertained? We resonate with with these characters who have a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. 
Now, sometimes, in defense of you guys, us guys, us husbands, it can be a chronically critical and fault-finding wife who can destroy this God-given programming inside of all of us. But most of the time, and I do a lot of counseling, the spirit of adventure given to us by God is crippled by our own unwillingness to fulfill our biblical purpose at home. So let's expose it and unpack this text. Let's go back to Ephesians, that same passage. Husbands love, now I included the Greek word here for a purpose, you're going to see it. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now look at here, see my little laser? See that Greek word, husband's love? You notice anything here? As Christ loved? It's the same exact word. No pressure there, guys. But we have a responsibility to love as Christ loved our wives, to lift them up. I'll get to that in just a minute. The last part of that scripture in Colossians, it says, and don't be bitter toward them. You know what that means? Don't call her honey and treat her like vinegar. Actions do speak louder than words. Oh, you've seen it before. Oh. I was with a guy one time. He kept calling his wife honey and special names. And then behind the scenes, he just treated her like garbage. The moment we treat our wives anything less than Christ treated the church, we place ourselves under judgment. Can I remind you what Jesus said? In Luke chapter 17, verse 1, he says, Temptation is bound to come. But woe to that person through whom it comes. Men, do you know that we can lead our families into sin and temptation? We're the gatekeepers, but with that comes great responsibility. So what does fulfilling our biblical role look like as husbands? Loving our wives as Christ loved the church. If your wife is having trouble submitting to you, there's most likely a good reason for that. When you fulfill your biblical role, or let me make this personal for all of us. When we fulfill our biblical role as a husband, our wives will then find it easy to fulfill theirs. What does that look like? We don't always have to agree, folks, guys, but we must validate the way she feels. Does your wife, does your wife feel protected, provided for? Do you treat her like a princess? Or like a frog. Have you seen the pain in her eyes when we hurt them? Are you dating your mate? I don't care how old you are or how long you've been married. Are you still dating? Michelle and I sometimes walk down the mall or something holding hands, and I'll tell her, I said, you know what people are thinking, don't you? She said, what? We're not married. <laughs> now, this is huge, guys. I learned this. Listen. Listen through my own counseling, not me doing the counseling, but being in counseling. And by the way, let me tell you, if you're sitting there right now going, oh, our marriage is a mess. Hell, welcome, welcome to the club. We're all a mess, but in Christ, we're a perfect mess. And if you need some help, get some help. There are people out there who have trained their whole lives for the purpose of helping us make it through this tough thing called life. And marriage is hard work. Good place to say amen. I know husbands are going... I want to say something, but I don't, I'm afraid to. <laughs> Counseling is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of real strength. It's when we can admit, you know what? I don't have it all together, and I just need a little bit of help. So for those men who say, you know what? I'm just not a loving guy. I'm, not, I'm just not a patient guy. I'm kind of got a short fuse. That's the way God made me. That's just the way I'm wired. Nope. That's the way you've chosen to be. Do you hear me? I tend to, and I, oh, I tend to drive a little impatiently. <laughs> Michelle has many times said, I'm never riding with you again. She's not joking. And so I have to apologize. And, and I could look at her and go, you know what? I'm just impatient. That's the way God made me. No, no, sir. That's the way I've chosen to be. And I've had to work on that. In the last two weeks, Michelle has said, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you. You're getting better. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
When's the last time you led your wife in prayer or a brief study of the scriptures? You don't have to be a career theologian, man. You just pray together. Open up the scriptures, learn together. There are books out there to help you do this. Listen, man, that's what it looks like to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Quick story, I tell this to kids all the time in those talks on dating teenagers. I'll say there was this girl. She couldn't get a date. And all of a sudden, two guys ask her out. She has one date on Friday night, one date on Saturday night. She's gone from famine to feast. She and her mom have a terrific relationship. She goes on that first date. She comes home. Her mom's waiting up for her. How'd it go? She said, oh, mom, it was awesome. It was awesome. Why was it so awesome? Because all night long, I felt like he was the greatest person in the world. Wow. A lot of pressure on the guy tomorrow night. She goes out the date the next night, comes home. Her mom says, how was it? Oh, mom, it was even better than last night. How could it be better than last night? She said, because all night, I feel like I was the most important person in the world. Paradigm shift, right? Oh, husbands. Paul wrote, consider the interests of others first. That begins at home. All right, kids, here you go. Now, next service, I know we'll have a lot more teenagers, but you can pass this along. How about that? <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. A mom was preparing pancakes for her two boys. You got Kevin, he's five. You got Ryan, he's three. Both of them are starving and can't wait to eat the first pancake. The mom saw an opportunity for a lesson here. And so she said, boys, if Jesus were here, he would say, you take the first pancake, I can wait. Kevin, the five-year-old, looks at his three-year-old brother, Ryan, and says, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> Kids, we've all been there. These kids today, they think, you don't know how we feel. How do you think I got to be this age, man? I, I just popped out a mama at 55 years of age. I was your age. I've been there. I've seen the pain I've caused my parents. Oh, kids. Mark Twain. He said, when your child turns 13, put them in a barrel, seal the lid, drill a hole in it, feed them through the hole. He said, when they turn 16, plug up the hole. Parenting is hard work. One of my favorite comedians is Jim Gaffigan. Here's what he said. The hardest part of parenting is when I'm with my kids. <laughs> Look at this. This quote. Children now think they're entitled. They have no manners. They display contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love to talk. Children now rule the house rather than honor their parents. They contradict their parents, interrupt others, and disrespect others. New? Nope. Plato. 427 B.C. I've now been in youth ministry for 35 years, 24, of the, 24 years of those in full time. I saw this clip off of Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil. It's about 45 seconds long. I just had to show it. Here we go. You wrote in to me. Tell me what you wanted me to get straight with your mom. I want my mom to understand that I can't live off of $1,000 a month, and I grew up on a certain lifestyle. She can't just take that away from me immediately. If someone took her lifestyle away from her, she wouldn't like that. And I grew up on it. It's all I ever know. I can't deal with this. And so I came to you for help. Okay. So you want me to get her to do what? What would be the home run for you? I need her to understand that I need at least $2,500 a month. She's not, she works all the time. She doesn't do anything for me. She doesn't drive me anywhere. And so other people would have their moms, like, drive them places, buy them food, make them food. But I have to do everything myself, and I need the funds for that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> $2,500 a month allowance. <laughs> I don't think I even had $2.50 allowance <laughs> when I was her age. Working my job at Chick-fil-A and Whataburger. Man, I spent what I made. Uh, now, this is an extreme example, of course, and I don't make fun of her. She's the one who put herself on national television. Uh, but there is a sense of entitlement today, is there not? And by the way, when I talk about dating to teenagers, 
I'll tell the girls when I'm talking about godly characteristics to look for in a guy to date, I'll tell them, watch how he treats his mother. Well, I see a lot of heads out there nodding. You could preach this same thing, couldn't you? I mean, we've been around the block a few times. And if you're like me, we've made some of the same mistakes. So is disobedience to parents really that big a sin? (laughs) I don't know. Um, You tell me. The Ten Commandments. First five deal specifically with our relationship with the Lord. The second five deal specifically with our relationship with one another. You know what that first of the second five is? Honor your father and mother. So how does God see disobedient parents? Oh, well, look at this list. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a morally corrupt mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of evil, such as covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, haters of God, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Wow. What a list for disobedient to parents. Let's exposit that passage real quickly. Parallel passage in Ephesians 5. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. This promise is so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What does that mean? I know some folks who have obeyed their parents and they've died young. I mean, come on. Well, let's go to the Old Testament law, shall we? Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father and mother, even though they discipline him. In such a case, father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate, which was what they did. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn, rebellious. He wants $2,500 a month and refuses to obey. He's a glutton, a drunkard. Then all of the men of this town must stone him to death. Aren't you glad, kids? for the new covenant (laughs) that has been introduced to us through Christ, more specifically within the New Testament. And in this church age, the Lord wants us to have a full life. Look what it says in the Amplified Rendition translation of this verse. Children, obey. See that word? Children, obey your parents as God's representatives. You ever been misrepresented? Somebody says, oh, So-and-so told me that you said this. No, I didn't. How angry you get. Can you imagine representing God? Obey your parents in all things, for this attitude of respect and obedience is well-pleasing to the Lord, will bring you God's promised blessing. So this attitude, there's a difference between obeying your parents with respect and honor and anger. You've heard it before. Go clean your room. Okay. Okay. Run, stomp in there, slam the door, and they cram everything where? In the closet or under the bed. That's not what God's saying here. But what I want you to see here, this parallel, and the reason I included the original Greek word here is this next, this further insight. This is, this is fascinating. So you see the word there, the Greek word. See that is the same, same one. Peter had been miraculously released from, from prison here in the early part of Acts. Peter knocked, out the, uh, knocked at the outer entrance. He's left prison miraculously, and he goes to the house where all his friends are while they're praying for him to be released from prison. And a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. Same, same. Disobedient to parents is ignoring their authority. By ignoring their authority, you're obeying, you're ignoring God's authority. That's heavy, isn't it? I want to hear from God. No, you don't. No, you're just telling him, I got this, I don't need you. Now that'll change change your world, won't it, as a child? So, parents were never called, biblically, to be your child's best friend, give them everything they want so they don't throw a fit. And I tell kids all the time, look, we parents are flawed, deeply flawed. You have good days, we have good days. You have horrible days, we have horrible days. Sometimes, we admit it, we get it flat wrong. We respond in anger, we say things we don't mean, but no one on planet Earth loves you more than your mom and your dad. Give them a break. Honor them. Bob Griffin, my music pastor, 
at the church in Abilene where I surrendered to the ministry. I'm a teenager. Uh, the intimacy between me and my mom at that time is a mile wide. Uh, she's remarried. I don't like the guy she married. It, it's a horrible time. I'm dating a girl. My mom hates that girl. And because she hates her, guess what? I'm just going to keep dating her. And so uh, this chasm has grown. And, and I, I, so I talked to my, my, my music pastor, Bob. I say, Bob, you got to help me with this. Mom wants me to break up with her. She's badgering me. And you know what? Mom, she never even goes to church. Bob looked at me and said, Nick, show me in the Bible where it says, honor your father and mother if they go to church. Silence. I didn't feel condemned, but I was under so much conviction. Stick a pin in that. We'll come back to it in just a moment. Final word on this one. Children, kids, never, ever, ever do something a parent tells you to do that's illegal or unbiblical. Ever. You immediately contact the authorities on another adult. Again, abusive husbands, abusive wives, abusive parents will use these passages of scripture just like a cult leader will they'll take it out of context and use it to hurt others this next one fathers do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged well what does that mean well let's look at the text shall we fathers don't provoke your children to anger Here's what that means from the Amplified Bible. Do not provoke them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism. Listen, you've done that before? So did Joseph in Genesis. So, so what I'm saying, there's no condemnation here. We've all messed up. Samuel, the prophet Samuel, horrible parents. But it's never too late to do the right thing. So really what he's saying here is refrain from any kind of berating, belittling, or shaming. Now this is not an argument against tough love. We can be assertive without being aggressive. The command here is just to make certain that even our discipline is driven by love. You see a pattern here? Paul said, be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. We love one another as Christ loved the church. Oh, wow. I don't know who said this, but I've been preaching it for decades. It is a philosophical statement, but it's quite true. You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. Parents who tend to be abusive and angry and don't get help for their own issues, listen, you teach what you know. But you, I've been at, listen, I've been in youth ministry for a long, long time. I have watched the child grow up and take on both the good and the bad from the parent. I did the same thing and had to receive counseling for it as a result of my dad. If you, how many of you remember the song Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin? Haunting, haunting song. You're young, Google it, not right now, but later on, Cats in the Cradle. The dad made a lot of mistakes. He neglected his family, traveled a lot. At, by the end of the song, his son's now grown, has a family, lives far away. And his son is, his, the dad calls the son and says, hey, it sure would be nice if you could come home and just see us. Do you remember the last line? The dad says, as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me. He'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Now, for you dads, you think, man... How do I do this? How do I be the hero and, and be this kind of person for my, for my child? And you think, man, I need to look like the rock. Look at me. Look at me. I look more like this. It's not our ability, my friends. It's our availability, right? I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He said, since it is so likely that children will meet Cruel enemies, let them at least have heard of brave knights and heroic courage. And where better, dads, for our children to see these, this bravery and courage lived out, than in us, in our weakness, our flaws. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am what? I am strong. Oh, my friends. 
It's all about submitting to the Lord and His authority. Well, real quick, this whole slave uh, employer and th- this. Let me say one thing about this: Scripture never advocates slavery. Sometimes critics and skeptics and cynics will will rush in and say the Bible supports slavery. No, it doesn't. Never show me in Scripture where it does. You won't find it. What happens is the writers of the New Testament acknowledge it as a part of society, an ugly part of society. Oh, it was established well before this, and as you well know, it was established well after. All races, all nations. And so what he's doing, he's simply giving advice to the employer-employee relationship. Remember that just because the Bible records something doesn't mean it approves. There's a lot of ugly stuff. It's unedited, our, our Bible, unsanitized. The text real quickly, Peter said, honor the emperor. It doesn't matter who's president, folks. I don't care if it's a Democrat. If Hillary had won, I would pray for her and honor that position. Trump, that guy needs to stay off Twitter. Oh, he's done some things good, but good grief, man. Listen, whoever is in office, the Bible says honor him. It's not like God stepped out of, the, stepped out of his office for a moment and, oh my goodness, I've come back and look who won the election. God is sovereign and on his throne. And I tell you what, this world's not going to be saved in the White House. It's going to be saved as we pray in the church house. Amen? As I think about the employer-employee relationship, and we're finishing up now, I was selling women's shoes my senior year in high school. That will set you free, man. A guy came up in my church. He said, Nick, how would you like to work at Abilene National Bank as a teller? Ooh, hey, that sounds great. So he said, okay, come on in. And he's seen me. He knows me. He brings me in for an interview, and I'm so excited I can't wait. He says, Nick, great, wonderful interview. And uh, as I'm walking out the door, he says, oh, by the way, you'll need to cut your hair. What? Oh, yeah, you need to cut your hair. Now, this guy was a jerk, and everybody knew it. I said, now, I'm not talking. You go get, get your, if I go get my hair cut now, it looks just like this, but shorter. Here's me in high school. <laughs> so what he's telling me to do, and see that when I played football, my hairstyle just perfectly outlined the football helmet. <laughs> so we're talking an entirely different hairstyle that just hurt my um, in, my insecurities and, and yes I had people laugh at me because I had to get it cut real short a whole different style parted in the middle that's the then I keep thinking this part here in the middle it's going to come back one day okay so I told you stick a pin in that story with me and Bob Griffin and honor your where does it say honor your father and mother if they go to church let's come back to that let's close with this so I sat there under crushing but loving conviction went home found my mom and understand there's no intimacy it is like ice cold between her and me said mom i just need to apologize you could feel just like winter begins to thaw in the narnia it began to thaw And I said, I know this girl. I I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't be dating her. Mom looks at me. She says, Nick, by this time I've surrendered my life to the ministry. I did that when I was 16, I think. And she said, Nick, I love you. I don't care if you date her. I said, okay. She said, There are just so many things I see here. You're called to the ministry, but she's not. I don't see this going anywhere good. God opened the eyes of my heart at that moment. A month later, I broke up with that girl. That did not go well. Two months later, I was entertaining at Hardin-Simmons University for an event 
for incoming freshmen. August school, just like about to have there at, at all the campuses. So they brought all the freshmen in, and it's the weekend before classes begin, and here they all are, and I'm doing my shtick, you know, playing the piano, and same old, same old. And so then after that, we have a big square dance. Oh, yes. <laughs> Baptist school. <laughs> so I got down there, we're in this huge circle, and there is a girl directly across from me I cannot take my eyes off of. Her name was Michelle. Two years later, I married her. You know, what is the Lion of Judah telling us today? He's saying this. Submitting to earthly authority is equivalent to submitting to my authority. To resist his blatant sin, obey me and watch all heaven break loose. Had I continued to rebel and operate in anger and dishonor, I may have missed Michelle. Could have. God will give us over to our mistakes if we insist. In a moment, we're going to stand. Look, husbands, there's some of you owe your wife an apology. Wives, maybe the same thing. Kids to parents, who knows? You can do it during this time. You can do it later. But some of you know. Conviction has fallen on me today. It's time for a change so that all heaven can break loose. Let's pray together. Musician's going to come up. My friends, here in a moment, as we bow our heads, close our eyes, let's just think this through.